Today we are going to make the lid and the hinge mechanism for the electrical kiln, which is assisted by this stainless steel spring. In the last part we finished the heating elements which you can see on the left side of the kiln here. For the lid, the bottom half of the oil drum is cut to size and insulated and placed on the top of the kiln. On the side of the kiln, long 1-inch steel tubes are mounted, using some mounting brackets you will see in a second. The same is true for the lid, where a shorter piece of steel tubing is mounted using rivets. To support the lid, a long section of steel tube is also mounted. And for increased stability, some 4mm thick steel flat bar is added to sandwich the hinge mechanism, both vertically and diagonally. The piece just described are then mirrored on the back side as seen here. Looking a bit closer we can see the smooth steel rod which acts as the pivot of the hinge mechanism. It is held in place by two retention pins going through each end of the steel rod. Everything else is bolted together using 12mm threaded steel and nuts. Then we'll be making six of these brackets which are bolted to the vertical steel bars and mounted with rivets to the steel drum. Before getting started with the construction, we'll briefly jump into Fusion 360, where the handle for the lid can be seen, which is also made of the same 4mm steel bar. Here you can see how the lid opens, seen from the side, and finally a section view of the kiln cut open, seeing how the different layers of insulation is mounted. Now we can get started by cutting all the needed pieces of square steel tube to length. And the same happens for the steel flat bar for the supporting pieces of the hinge mechanism. A piece of round steel tube is cut to be used as a spacer between the square steel tubes, which can be fitted over the M12 threaded rods. Speaking of the threaded rods, they are also being cut to length here. Before drilling all the holes, I measure and mark the location using a caliper. I start by drilling a small pilot hole before bringing in the big 12mm drill. Doing this by hand easily results in non-round holes and other troubles, so I quickly ask my neighbor to borrow his drill press. This makes life a lot easier, even though this drill press is cheap and of questionable quality. The two pieces of steel flat bar can be clamped together using a nut and bolt, making it easier to file the round ends. And now for the mounting brackets, which are cut to length and then bent in the vise to the side 103 degrees angle using a hammer. I use a digital angle gauge to estimate when I reach the correct angle, and finally check it by holding it up to the working drawing. All six brackets are cut and bent, so we can move on to drilling small holes for the rivets and larger holes for the 12mm threaded rods. All the metal parts are sanded down and wiped off with some acetone preparing them to be painted. I'm using some black hammerite paint which can withstand up to 80 degrees C continuous temperature. I believe this is sufficient as they will not be in direct contact with any very hot surfaces. All the parts are now left to dry overnight.
In the meantime, the lid edge can be cut to let the steel tubes fit. I start by cutting two slits using the hacksaw and then move on to using the angle grinder. According to the drawings, I mark the locations of the st top steel tubes and where holes for rivets needs to be drilled. And the larger drill is used on the other side to quickly debury all the holes. Three holes are also drilled on the side of the lid for mounting the shorter piece of steel tube. Four holes are drilled on the opposite side, allowing the handle to be mounted using rivets. Now the top steel tube assembly can be placed on the lid and fixed in place using steel rivets. And the same is done for the steel tube on the side of the lid. With all rivets mounted in the lid, we can move on to cleaning the inside, getting ready to mount the insulating material for the lid. I'll be using the same heat resistant cement as shown in part 1 and apply a generous amount. Before inserting the insulating silicate material, I make the surface slightly wet, as this should help with the fire cement to adhere. Next, the four fire bricks cut in part 1 can be inserted. And all remaining gaps are filled with extra fire cement. Off camera, I cut off the extra steel edge on the lid so it can fit snugly on top of the kiln. And now it's just a matter of assembling all the parts, beginning with the diagonal pieces of steel flat bar. With the vertical steel tubes in place, the whole locations for the mounting brackets can be marked and drilled. Before inserting the threaded rods through the steel tubes and brackets, the brackets are mounted with two steel rivets each. And then the threaded rods are inserted and secured with locking M12 nuts. I found this steel shackle, which hopefully makes it possible to mount the spring securely in a moment. Before testing the newly assembled lid mechanism, the smooth rod, which everything pivots around, is secured in place with these two retention pins. This is actually more stable than I hoped for, but the lid is quite heavy and will therefore be assisted with this big steel spring I bought online. Sebastian gives a helping hand to get the spring in place, and I'm quite pleased with the result. This is it for part 3, and in the next video we'll see how all the control electronics will be assembled and mounted on the side of the kiln. See you soon, and take care.